right. Well, thank you for having me. So I'm not really a slides guy, but I did put together a Jamboard so I'd have something to uh, for y'all to look at um, other than just me. So I'm going to share that if that's all right. And um, that requires me then figuring out where I've put all the faces. So let me put them back where I can see them. And I can be talking to you instead of off to the side here. All right. Um, look, who's Mike Kuhn? So as, uh, as Amitai mentioned, I've been in IT for a long time. I started in 79 in the Air Force. Um, but for the last few years, I've been coaching. And coaching is very interesting because you get to go to lots of contexts. And I have primarily followed around um, the BCG and the McKinsey's and the uh, Accenture's of the world where they're doing agile transformations for enterprise type companies. Um, my practice has evolved from sort of you know, talking about the frameworks and talking about the actual techniques to really helping people be successful regardless of what's happening in these transformations and figure out um, you know, where we can change our behaviors uh, to both be compatible with whatever the organization is doing and also um, lead to some, set, some personal success. So uh, I'm happy to say that most of the people that I coach, and I do a lot of one-on-one -on -one coaching and small group coaching, most of the people I coach um, end up getting promoted and a lot of that uh, seems to be the result of uh, our conversations. It, it's always their work, right? But uh, our conversations sort of helping folks direct um, their efforts and what what they're attuned to. So that's what I want to talk about a little bit today. I've, I've uh, Jipa Hill talks about that stuff I'm always on about. Um, he didn't say stuff, but uh, the stuff I've been on about for the last uh, year or so is, hey, what, what do we ask for and what do we ask about and how does that change the nature of our, of our work environment? So that's what I'm going to talk about a little bit today. Um, I'm very interested in questions as they come up and I am super interested in uh, anything where someone is, you know, if you think I'm I'm wrong. Um, I love to hear that. And uh, I love to hear about how uh, what I've observed is not matching your experience. So feel free to um, be a contrarian, uh, you know, reasonably polite contrarian, although that's not very important to me either, um, the politeness part. So let's talk a little bit about what organizations generally I come to organizations and, and what they want, right? So they want autonomous, cross-functional, resilient, professional engineering teams to have a sense of ownership, to work in a world of work-life balance and bring their creativity to bear on innovative customer experiences that delight those customers and have them high-fiving the um, development teams. So that's what we, that's what a lot of people want. So, uh, or say that they want. And what we sort of see a lot of um, is roadmaps and processes and timelines and racy matrices and JIRA boards and iteration plans, solo workers, working toward a contract with a commitment and the customers and the other people they need to talk to are sort of living in a fortress where they're protected from actually having to uh, interact. So it might only be me, but it seems that, uh, th that those things are not necessarily consistent. And what I hope to do is bring some consistency because a lot of the things that we see in the world and that we see in the world of work are there. They're, they're super 
resilient, they're super, uh, or persistent is a better word, they're super persistent, um, and they're not easily changed. But what we can do is change the, the content. And if we change the content, we can often get the results and we can leverage uh, those systems that are already in place. Um, so, so I said I was going to talk about what we ask for and what we ask about. So let's start with what we ask for. Um, what we ask for has a huge effect on the ownership. So uh, what I've noticed is a lot of times I, I'll be talking to a manager, or to, uh, especially managers, and they'll say, you know, I, I just wish people would show a lot more initiative and, and folks seem to be waiting around for me to tell them what to do. And, um, and I just really wish that they would be, uh, you know, more on their own, more autonomous and, and those things. And I've told them that they can be, and, and I just don't understand why they won't. And then I, so I'll start sort of talking with folks and say, well, what is it that we're asking people to do? And you'll see sort of a list of tasks, right? Do this task, implement this uh, solution, uh, something that I've come up with, um, you know, get task X done, uh, make feature, you know, test feature X, whatever they are. And they're sort of these tasks that, um, that sort of reflect this idea that's, that's all too common that as a manager, or as a, sometimes a scrum master or a PO, I'm sort of the head and, and these folks are my hands and feet. Um, I won't say minions because that would be bad, but, but they're sort of the hands of, and feet and they are executing my will. And so we ask people to execute our will. And when we ask people to execute our will to, you know, to do these tasks, um, you know, what does that do to the sense of ownership? And I submit that it retains ownership in the asker, right? So now the manager still owns it. Uh, they own the results. And um, there's a great example of what happens when you can own the results and you just ask people to do tasks. Um, I used to work in a, in a town in Alabama that had been a mill town. And so I'm talking to this older guy and he's telling me about the time when they crashed the mill. I'm like, oh, okay, so what happened when you crashed the mill? He says, well, we had this bale of hay or a bale of cotton, I mean, we had this bale of cotton and we had set it off to the side because uh, there was some barbed wire or a fence post or something in it and it was gonna tear up the machine and we hadn't figured out exactly how we we're gonna deal with it, but we didn't wanna run it through the machine. <laughs> But the boss, and he said, boss man, boss man comes along and says, hey, what is that bale of uh, cotton doing over there? It needs to be, it needs to be processed, get it processed right now. Guy says, starts to say, well, it's over there. He's like, look, I don't care what you, what excuse you've got. I need to see that thing processed. So they run it through and they break up the machine and, and now everyone is stopped. But boss, in that case, boss man owns that result. Um, and, you know, and then we see the same sort of thing. Maybe you guys don't, but I have seen the same sort of thing in IT where someone says, look, do this task. Someone talks about why that task is, or starts to talk about why maybe that task is not the appropriate thing to do right now. They get overrode and you end up with some sort of problem. Well, the, the manager in that case owns those results. So, uh, so what we ask for has a huge effect on the sense of ownership. If you've retained ownership of the results, if you've retained ownership of, of sort of the process and, and the workflow, um, uh, it's yours now. And, you know, good or bad, it's yours. And some people are cool with that, but most of us, you know, the same sort of managers who be like, I don't understand why people won't take more initiative and have more ownership over things. Um, the, we, want to, we want to pass ownership over to the next person, right? We want to pass it over to the, to the worker that's working. We want to give them this gift of ownership. If we don't, we sort of hoard it and uh, keep it for ourselves, which is not always awesome. So, um, 
the approach that I try to talk to people about and, and really uh, advocate is that we ask people to solve a problem. So if we'll go back to the bale of cotton, if you walk up and you say, hey, you know, what's going on with that bale of cotton that's been there all day? And someone says, well, you know, it's got barbed wire or a fence post or something in it, and we're trying to figure it out. And so, oh, okay, what ideas do you have? Um, or, you know, is there anything I can help you with in order to make that happen? Now, the person that, that is gonna do the processing now owns that problem of how, we, how can we get this processed? And, you'd offer, and you've offered them uh, some assistance with the, you know, things that are within your realm. So, you know, that assistance might be anything. It might be to get some other people involved. It might be to, um, to get some equipment that you need, whatever it is. But you've passed ownership while retaining the ability to assist a person. And, um, and you've averted disaster that you might not have even known. Um, there's no way that guy is going to run the disastrous uh, cotton bale through the mill now um, that, that you've been made aware of what's going on and you've asked them to solve that problem. Same thing happens in our work. So if we ask people to solve a problem, we, we are giving them the gift of ownership um, of those results. Um, the other thing is this idea of, the, of which thing allows you to uh, be creative. So if I tell you to do a task, or if I ask you to do a task in a specific way, sort of your room for creativity is, is diminished. Um, it, if I ask you to solve a problem, and we're gonna get to some things around solving a problem. If I ask you to solve a problem, I'm, all, I'm asking you to bring your creativity to bear on this problem, whatever it is. Um, and then finally, this chances of being delighted. Um, if I'm the smartest person in the room, and I have come up with the best possible solution to whatever the thing is, and I articulate that perfectly to other people, and those people perfectly understand it and perfectly execute on that understanding, my best case scenario is to not be disappointed. Yeah, you know, that's that is my that's you know my best case. If everything goes perfectly, then I'll be uh, probably not happy, but I won't be disappointed. If, on the other hand, I ask people to solve a problem and they, and they ignite their creativity toward that problem and toward that solution, we're going to talk about constraints as well. Within the constraints that we have, I have an excellent chance of, of them finding something that's even better than what I could have imagined and delighting me with their solution. Uh, in this business, we pay people well. We hire smart people. We're very intentional about how we do that. And it's, we short ourselves, um, we short ourselves really badly if we ask them to do tasks, if we become taskmasters rather than sort of, uh, vision translators, right? <laughs> or uh, the oracle of, hey, these are things that might be cool. So um, I want to keep my chances of being delighted. One of my favorite conversations, and I work with a guy still now uh, that I used to have this conversation with a lot, is uh, his name is Matt. I'd say, Matt, you know what would be cool? And I'd say something and and then, you know, a day later or a few hours later, or sometimes a week later, Matt's like, hey, Mike, you want to see something cool? And it will be something that's better than I could ever have imagined. And it will be very cool. Um, and I, I love to be delighted. That's I want to maintain my ability to be delighted whenever I can. So, uh, so yeah, that's what we ask for. And um and I'll, I'll come back to this uh, a little bit. So uh, sense of ownership, 
if we can give over that sense of ownership by asking people to solve a problem and uh, and bring their creativity to it, I think we get that. Um, otherwise, we sort of hoard all of the results for ourselves, good and bad. Like there's probably some good stuff in here and probably some stuff that maybe we uh, regret. Um, people are natural problem solvers. And, and this is sort of a recurring theme with me is that there is a natural way that we work. There's the natural way that people are uh, and that we be. And that is that we solve problems. We love to solve problems and we love to solve problems creative, creatively. If you give me a checklist uh, to go through, I'm unlikely to be super pleased, but uh, in fact, yeah. So this is checklist guy. He's He's been asked to do tasks and he just is going through a checklist and he looks um, super engaged. If we go back to the beginning, we said we wanted, you know, engaged, create, creative folks really working. This lady here, I have no idea what's going on with her, but she's in the snow in some sort of makeshift tent and she just looks happy. And this is one of the things that I tell people, we love the story of, and this is where we get to the constraints, we love this, the survival story where someone got dropped in the wilderness with a plastic spoon and you know walks out into civilization two weeks later. We're way less impressed with, um, with the person who followed an itinerary um, with a fully, uh, you know, with a fully equipped tour guide that uh, brought them through the uh, tourists, uh, experience in the wilderness. So I, I just love this picture because that's what makes happy humans is to overcome adversity with our brain power. And whatever that adversity is, solve problems with our brain power. All right. So having talked a little bit about what we ask for, and again, ask people to solve problems. They love doing that. Um, and it gives them a sense of ownership. What we ask about is equally and differently important. Um, so at the beginning, I'm gonna scroll back over here. We said we want autonomy and a sense of ownership and work-life balance. We want people to be creative and to have excellent engineering practices and to be cross-functional so that they can delight our customers. I would ask you, uh, this would be kind of more fun in a room, um, but I would ask you, when's the last time your boss asked you about how you were coming along at creating better work-life balance? Or even how you were, how you were making the team more cross-functional and resilient? Um, I've not been to the stand-up where someone says, oh, yeah, I spent yesterday working with Artie uh, to make sure that he can do my job um, and or to, or to clear up a misunderstanding of the way we did things. You don't hear those conversations in a stand-up very often or, or in any other thing. What you hear a lot about is, hey, what's the status of feature X? What's the status of uh, process Y? We, you know, we don't hear, how'd that meeting go? We don't hear um, about those things like resilience. How are we making the team more resilient? Um, what have we done to add to our cross-functionality? Uh, what engineering, what, what, what sort of engineering excellence thing are we working on this week? Um, even if those things show up in a retro, we very rarely hear about them uh, from managers. Even a lot of times scrum masters and, and certainly POs are not talking about those things. So what we ask about really reveals what we care about. And what most of us are hearing most of the time in my experience is that we care about feature X. We care about uh, 
we care about the budget, we care about feature X, we care about how well utilized people are. Um, I do hear the conversation, hey, I noticed that, you know, uh, George was out um, all of Wednesday, so how are we going to make up that productivity? Um, or, you know, gosh, it, it sure does seem like Barry has a lot of time to hang out and talk at the at the water cooler. Um, are they just not busy enough? So we, you know, it tells us, it tells everyone that works for us, oh, we care about busyness. We care about utilization. We care about presence. Um, and this is when, you know, in my little bio, we talk about, I help people understand what their values are. Uh, a lot of times I get this uh, set of aspirational values. Oh, we care about work-life balance and autonomy and creativity. And if we actually test that, we find out, well, we want to care about those things, but they're not necessarily what we care about. So if, and I'll ask people, I say, okay, so if I'm a Thai, uh, strolls into the office at 10 a.m. and works with everyone, you know, he's in the mob or, or whatever, he's working with everyone. But then at 2 p.m., he's like, look, I gotta go. And, and he's leaving every day at two or 2.30 uh, to do something else. What's our emotional response to that? And a lot of times our emotional response to that is not very positive. So, it, it, we have to reveal even to ourselves what we care about. Um, and a lot of times we don't know. We don't know that Amitai was up at six in the morning and worked for three hours before taking kids to school um, and then uh, is picking kids up and will be working until nine in the evening on stuff, uh, you know, after, after, well after we've, uh, we're four beers in. So uh, anyway, it reveals what we care about. It signals our priorities. Um, if we care more about features than we do about team resiliency, we're going to get features. And even if it makes the team more fragile, because we will parallelize our work and each person be working on their own thing um, because we care about features. And then that has, as a leader, that, ha that can have a very real and strong effect on our personal credibility. So if we're saying on the one hand, we care about these aspirational values, but what we're asking about and what we're getting status on is uh, features and timelines and budget, uh, then we, we basically are walking around with a thought bubble above our head that says we're full of crap. Um, and and we just or, or that we're a hypocrite or maybe a little of both so um you know so work-life balance versus features teamwork versus individual assignments learning versus utilization busyness versus thoughtfulness so you know what is it that we actually care about uh proven solutions versus innovation i still see so much where people want to be innovative companies and they want to be innovative teams and they're talking about best practices and copying and pasting the Spotify model or uh, or you know code from Stack Overflow or or whatever they really um, are not uh, putting forth the effort to be thoughtful and, and learn about our context. So that's sort of the scheme that's sort of the scheme around hey what do, what am I on about these days? Let me look at this chat. Uh, water cooler. Yeah, I wish we had water coolers. Um, yeah, budget and features are also important. Absolutely, they're important to ask about. So I'm going to look through the chat. Please, if you've got questions or, or contrariness, especially, um, either uh, pop off of mute and have a chat or, um, or put them in the, in the chat. So uh, sure, budgets and features are, are important to get done, and they're somewhat important to ask about. What's sort of interesting is that if, in my experience, if you work on the health of a team, 
budgets, uh, you know, features and budgets sort of handle themselves. Um, if you're asking for the right things, we've provided a sense of ownership and, uh, you know, we've handed over that sense of ownership and, and those things uh, can take care of themselves. Back when I worked for people, um, I generally did not, I had sort of this policy of not talking to my boss about work. And um, so I would talk to my boss about how things were going and who's doing really well and all that. But um, I felt like, look, I know what I'm, I know what I'm doing and I know what we're supposed to do. And if there's problems, we can talk about that. But um, uh, but yeah, I don't talk too much about work. So George says, uh, talking with project manager who's complaining about poor quality of the system being built. <laughs> he asked every day about what had been done, but he never asked about the quality of it. And that's a great example. If, if we're just asking about uh, feature count or, or getting them done, and we're not asking about quality or fitness of purpose, um, those are things we care about too, right? And we, but we have to relate that that's what we care about. Um, the, I wanted to talk a little bit, and I should probably back up. I want to talk a little bit about constraints. Um, I don't know exactly what this lady's constraints are. One of them appears to be weather. Um, so, you know, there's constraints, but when we ask people to solve a problem, giving them constraints is incredibly important. It's part of what ignites creativity. Um, so I used to, I, for about a year and a half, I was going back and forth to Australia. I worked with uh, Telstra. And so one of the examples there is, if you're, if you're in the telecom business, if, if I say, hey, I want, if you're carrying a, a Telstra device, I want you to never be stranded in Australia. I want you to always be able to have some, always have connectivity. If I don't put the financial constraint on that, I'm going to get a lot of plans on the $50 billion project to put 5G you know, everywhere and blanket the subcontinent with 5G. but I don't have $50 billion. So if I say, but I, I still have the same problem that I don't want you to be stranded anywhere in Australia if you've got one of our devices. So if I say, look, this is the thing, I want you to never be stranded and my budget constraint is $2 billion or whatever it is. Then I've got people thinking about, well, how can I make this happen for $2 billion? And you guys may not see this, but what I've seen frequently is that people will, add, we do this budgeting process where we say, hey, give us your proposals for stuff you wanna do and how much it's gonna cost. So people do a proposal, they have the stuff they're gonna do, they price it out and then they go forward and say, hey, can I have this money? And you know, businesses are like, no, you can't have the money because I don't have it. And they'll be like, well, I guess we can't have the solution then, we can't solve that problem, or I guess we can only solve part of this problem or, or whatever it is. When you start with the constraint, people start to solve problems within that constraint. And you know there might be different ways to do it, but I, I'm pretty sure that I could have SMS everywhere for a couple billion dollars and people would not be stranded. So um, in Australia, I think you could do that for a couple of billion. But, um, but you know, you could test that out. Hey, what, what can I do within the constraints that I have? And that's, it's the constraint, uh, you know, it's the ask that transfers ownership. It's the constraint that ignites creativity. It's the constraint that gets people in problem solving mode and by nature, people are problem solvers. Um, and I just, I know everybody on this call is a problem solver, right? That's what we come into this business for. And um, I was talking to a, a potential client the other day and I, I mentioned 
that I didn't think that innovation labs were a very good idea. And he says, oh, that's really interesting because I'm actually right in the middle of, of creating an innovation lab. And, um, and I asked him if he'd, if he'd seen an innovation lab that had actually innovated very much stuff. And he said he had not, but he was sure that um, it could happen. So we talked about that a little bit and I think that it can happen. But one of the things that, um, one of those things that you see is we ask people, hey, be innovative, be creative, uh, be autonomous. And that's not the way people work, right? Um, you know, just be innovative sort of says, hey, come up with some novel idea that nobody, is, nobody else has ever had. And, um, you know, a lot of times, you know, create, create a need for us. So uh, an iPhone is sort of innovative in many ways. And it's also a convergence of a lot of technologies that were happening. Um, but anyway, so if I were going to do an innovation lab, I might ask someone, the first thing I might want to ask that team is to identify the problems that they'd like to solve, right? Figure out what the problems are. And, um, and then having targeted a problem, uh, then we can start working on innovation. Uh, or innovating and, and creativity, creatively solving that. So I might look at, hey, what's the problem I'd like to solve and what's the constraint we can solve it in? And we might have a shot at actually getting innovation. But if we just create a lab and say, oh, these people are gonna go be smart and, um, and create cool new stuff, uh, I just don't ever, that just doesn't seem to, in my experience, that just doesn't seem to work out very well. So, um, Anyway, uh, other questions or concerns? That's sort of, I mean, I could go on and on, but um, I eventually grow bored of hearing myself uh, yak away. And as Emma Tai mentioned, um, economy of expression is an important thing uh, in my mind. Comments, questions, um, arguments? Are we still here? I believe we are still here. Okay, <laughs> good. <laughs> this is a very interesting experience um, talking to a silent, uh, a silent room without uh, people or without movement. <laughs> so. Oh, great, we have some text. Um, first step in, yeah, first step in doing better. Uh, I, I really think that the first step in doing better is when we get ready to ask someone to do something is to be thoughtful about what we're asking them and how that, how that conveys ownership and whether that restricts or, or uh, whether that restricts or invites creativity. Um, and one of the things, so a lot of times we're not the manager, right? And so I'm, I'm really happy for this. Uh, a lot of times we're not the manager, but we wanna be able to help them. So if someone asks you to do a task, hey, do this task, blah, blah, blah. It, I think it's okay to, to probe, hey, what's the problem we're trying to solve here? Um, and help people be thoughtful. What's the problem we're trying to solve? What are the constraints you know, that we have uh, to solve it? Um, similarly, a lot of times we wanna have a, a feedback culture and we say, oh, please give me good, honest feedback. That's what I really want. And, um, and, and then you sort of wonder why you don't get it. Um, I'm actually, uh, in the engagement I just left, they had a question that managers were supposed to ask of their folks, which was, how well do I take feedback? And 
well, it's, and, and then they were going to be scored on the, on people's answers to this. And what I thought was really interesting about that is if you, if you don't take feedback, well, you're really likely to, when asking that question, how well do I take feedback to get lied to and be said, Oh, you're awesome at taking feedback. I really appreciate how well you uh, do that. And if you're not, if you're, are actually good at taking feedback, you're likely to get, well, you know, you could improve in this and that area. So um, I thought I thought that was kind of a, a interesting anti-pattern that they're working on. But anyway, um, uh, I, I think you can sort of ask people to get back to, you know, get to the root of the problem. What's the problem we're trying to solve with this task? How would we know that, that it would actually be solved? Um, and sort of prompt thoughtfulness from the people that are asking you of things. And as a as the asker, as a as a person in power, usually, um, you know, be a little more, uh, you know, be a little more intentional about what we're asking for. Um, let's see the. Uh, you know, sort of back on feedback culture, and this is just a technique. So I, I love having actionable small techniques. Uh, if you want to create a culture of feedback and you want people to feel free to give you honest feedback, um, one of the things that I've found really works is to say, um, hey, I did this thing. So if I want honest feedback from you all, which I'm, I'm a little concerned, maybe I don't want to do, um, I might say, hey, you know, I really felt like this slide of the lady there with the um, fire didn't wasn't on point as well as it should be. What would you suggest would be better? And the key there is talk about some specific thing that you sort of are are asking for feedback on. Acknowledge that you're not that you didn't think you had done awesome, and then ask for their help. And um, yeah, how I might say, <laughs> right, what could I do better? And yeah, and I like this, what could I do better? And I might go even a little step further and say, you know, I felt like um, maybe I was dismissive the last time you were trying to talk to me about something, you know, did it come across that way to you? Or is there a better way that I could, you know, that I could deal with my body language or my, uh, or with how to set up when we're going to talk about things or whatever, um, but I think that specificity, specificity and um, and also the uh, acknowledgement that you were not that you didn't feel like you were awesome at something um, can invite feedback. And what's really great about that is if you do it enough times, people will start to volunteer feedback to you, um, and it also sets up a relationship where you can provide honest feedback to them. Um, so yeah, so Amitai says, what are surprisingly effective things that you've asked for or seen people ask for? Um, primarily for me, it is uh, because I'm coaching people, it's around feedback. A lot of times they're not getting really great stuff. Um, the other bit is, uh, that has been surprisingly effective is every time I think we know how things should be or, or what should be done next or whatever, um, if, if every time we think we know, we instead hand that off to the team for their discretion, that has been, I've never regretted that. And actually I've never even seen anybody regret uh, that sort of approach where you say, hey, um, I think we need to do, you know, this solution or this is the problem we need to work on or, you know, this is the thing we need to do next. Um, every time if you say, hey, team, um, let's talk about this. What do, you, what do you all think we should do next and why? Uh, what do you think we should, um, you know, what do you think is the most important thing and why? Um, yeah, so surprisingly effective thing is to sort of um, relinquish the idea that I know and invite the um, 
invite the input from the team and, and go with that. Uh, because every time five people and their five different perspectives are gonna have uh, a better understanding and better insights than any one person can have, no matter how smart you are, or how much great visibility you think you've got. So, um, yeah, and, and George, I would push that uh, to something where I'm actually making some acknowledgement that I've, that I've not been awesome. Um, because if I, especially if I've, if I live in a toxic world where, um, I worked at a place uh, where noting that something wasn't a very good process was an actionable criticism of management that would get you rid up, writ, get you written up. I didn't last very long there um, for some reason. Uh, and, and what was surprising is that the, the guy that was my boss um, when I handed him my resignation, he seemed all surprised. But and the the week before that, he'd been like, "I just want people to. I just want someone who will come to work and do what they're told and not ask any questions." <laughs> and I'm like, "So it was about a week later. I handed my because it took me a week to find a new job. I handed him my resignation. <laughs> he was like, "What's this?" <laughs> I'm like, "Dude, I am not the guy. Um, I'm never going to be the guy. Don't want to be the guy." So. Other things, I think we have time. We have we have plenty of time. <laughs> You're gonna have to use words, Amitai, because I don't. Those thumbs indicate the amount of time we have. We have two plenty amount of time. Oh, two plenty amount of time. Okay. Mm -hmm. yeah. yeah, that's a that's a cool production thing, huh? <laughs> I guess. <so. laughs> yeah. <laughs> I'm thinking of this in terms of, uh, in terms of like an individual's career progression also. Uh, mm. And it can be hard to know in a, when you're not informed what leadership cares about, what to ask for. And I wonder if you have insights for us for like a person trying to figure out how to show more responsibility, take more responsibility, like figure out what this company values and do more of it or decide that they, like you decide that that's not for them. Is there, is there a way to, to, to frame what you've talked about so far for that person? Yeah, so I think there's, there's a couple things and there's a question here about safety too and I wanna get to that. So uh, first from Lisa, you know, if you come across people or companies that don't respond to what you're trying to do or tell them, um, because of the way my practice works, Lisa, um, I generally have a couple of initial conversations that are not compulsory for me, but someone's boss has told them, hey, you need to talk to this guy. So we'll have a couple of conversations and then I make myself available for scheduling. And if you schedule, I show up is sort of the deal. People who are not open or, or don't are not ready or whatever to deal with what I'm talking about just quit scheduling. So I don't get a lot of um, a lot of pushback there. Uh, what's funny though is that people who do keep scheduling and keep talking generally get promoted, and sometimes the folks who don't um, end up working for them. Um, so you so and you end up having it whether you want it or not. Um, I'm, I'm going to get to uh, Camilla. It's Camilla, I think. Um, I'm going to get to that in just a second. But uh, Amitai, for hey, what do companies actually care about? Um, how you know that? And this is one of the things that can be really dangerous in a in a transformation, right? And all of us have been probably subject to transformations. One of the things that can be really dangerous in a transformation is we can see all those aspirational values. Oh, these are the things we value. These are the things we care about. These are awesome. But they haven't changed your job description. They haven't changed your uh, success factors. They haven't changed the things that you're being reviewed on 
uh, you know, KPIs or uh, they're not KPI, OKRs or whatever they are. So you'll still see a job description that says, you know, we want you to drive results and um, sort of have this sort of violent language around uh, driving and enforcing and, and stuff like that. Um, you got to go with what's in your best interest. And it is in your best interest to be compliant with the compensation plan. So if the compensation plan is still around uh, driving results and, and enforcing rules and all that, um, then the company's not there yet. And so you have to be very careful. And I've seen, I have seen this happen um, many times actually, where people who are doing, really doing, bought all into the aspirational values of the transformation and what they wanted to do when they're doing those behaviors that the company has said they wanted then are sort of harshly punished in the compensation area or at review time because those things don't match um, it's one of the reasons that uh, i like to work with hr when i can i like to work with hr or with people um, and i had some success with this at telstra where we worked on the job descriptions and the job postings for like QA managers. And we put in the job description some of the behaviors we wanted around uh, mentoring and developing uh, team members and, uh, and creating an environment and creating some uh, resilience. When you put those things in the job descriptions and then you put them in the success factors, what you find is that we hire smart people and they're going to work in their self-interest and they'll figure out how to make those things happen if that's their job. When it's not their job, we're sort of making this moral argument that it would be better, um, but it's frequently not better for the individual that's doing the things if we haven't got there. So you have to really be careful. Um, and that kind of speaks to this, the risk that comes with, uh, with the freedom in, a, in, in your working, right? Um, but you'll rarely find, um, you know, as, as an employee, if you're, if you're asked to solve a problem and you're working towards solving that problem within a set of constraints, uh, I think that's relatively, um, benign in terms of risk, uh, but, but acting much differently from your, uh, from how you get compensated is is risky and really it's not I would I don't advise it um, you you need to work toward your self-interest and uh, and your and if your self-interest is sort of out of whack it's good to to go ahead and, and talk with folks and that's part of what I talk to managers about too is like hey what do these job descriptions look like have you even looked at them have you reviewed them um, what are you asking about in the reviews? And that's the other, you know, so uh, what you add, that's, how can I say this? So I had this policy of not doing stuff my boss doesn't care about back when I had bosses. And so if you're not asking about it, you don't care about it. And if you don't care about it, I'm not worrying about it, right? I don't do it. I, that's not what I work on. And that's how you end up with, teams that are not resilient. I worked with this guy. They'd relabeled everybody. They put the Spotify method in and relabeled everybody. So this guy went from being a manager to being a uh, product owner. But he had the same team that he'd had for five years. It's five people, every one of them, individual contributors working on their only their own thing. And it had been that way for years. And um, I asked that guy, you know, so if I were to send you on vacation for a month, he was really a sort of micromanager. If I were to send you on vacation for a month, and the only caveat being that if your team can't work effectively while you're gone, um, you don't have a job to come back to. Can you take that vacation? He's like, oh, no, I could never do that. They have no idea how to work without me here. I'm like, oh, so you can't take a promotion either, right? is like, uh, I hadn't thought about it that way. I'm like, right, which is why you've had the same team for five years and you haven't been, you know, you haven't gone anywhere. 
so um he did sort of an about face we worked uh, quite a bit on uh team resilience and making himself um extra and uh it was after i left there but uh several months after i left there he did get promoted into a job with more responsibility so um yeah that's I don't know that that's responsive, but uh, yeah, the risk is really um, when your behaviors don't match how you get, uh, don't match both your self-interest and how you get um, compensated or evaluated. 